Welcome to Truth Trek, where we dive deep into the Bible to uncover the treasures there. I'm Pastor Jason Hovde, and I will be your guide as we journey together into Scripture, God's Holy Word. In today's episode, we will be taking a look at a passage that got me thinking a bit. And that passage is Hebrews chapter 12, verse 24, which says, And to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. In this podcast, we will discuss what it means, the blood of Abel. Is it talking about the blood from Abel's sacrifice, the sacrifice that God found acceptable when Cain's sacrifice was not? Is it talking about Abel's blood that God said was crying to him from the ground? As in the case of many biblical passages, not everyone agrees on this. In fact, as I studied this, I wondered if I should have left this topic alone. How can I say if my take on it is right? But as we go through this together, we will examine those two major viewpoints, and then I will tell you which one I think is correct. Our discussion then is going to be divided into three segments. In segment one, we're going to look at what we'll all call possibility one. The blood of Abel refers to Abel's sacrifice. Segment two, we'll look at possibility number two, which is that the blood of Abel in this verse refers to Abel's blood after Cain killed him. And then in segment three, we're going to wrap it all together and try to understand the whole passage in context. And understanding the whole passage in context helps us to get the correct meaning. Since the sprinkling of Jesus' blood is the blood of sacrifice, then this reference to the blood of Abel must refer to Abel's sacrifice, not Abel's death. Elling, Gorth, and Nita, in a handbook on the letter to the Hebrews, write, quote, Abel was earlier presented as the first true worshiper, not as the first murder victim. In this case, the main reference would be to Abel's sacrifice offered in faith, though his murder, considered as a sacrifice of himself, would not be excluded. So there you have the idea that because Abel was presented as a true worshiper in chapter 11, verse 4, not as a murder victim, then it would follow that this passage is talking about his sacrifice. Just to read that verse that they referred to in Hebrews 11, verse 4. This is in the, he the Heroes of Faith passage. It says there, By faith Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain, through which he was commended as righteous, God commending him by accepting his gifts. And through his faith, though he died, he still speaks. So when we consider that preceding this is chapter 11, where we find the list of the heroes of the faith, and that Abel is not mentioned there as being a murder victim, but as the first true worshiper, or at least the first mentioned as one who brought a fitting sacrifice, then therefore the conclusion could be made that the blood of Abel is connected to this mention in chapter 11, verse 4, so that it speaks not of Abel's blood, but the blood of Abel's sacrifice, which was sprinkled as a legitimate and acceptable sacrifice to God. Because scripture tells us God regarded Abel's sacrifice, but did not regard Cain's sacrifice. So God himself approved of that sacrifice, but even though God approved of uh, Abel's sacrifice, the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus speaks in a more commendable way to God. Since our verse is first comparing Jesus as the mediator of a new covenant, the reference of his sprinkled blood is the blood of an established covenant. This view may be saying that as Jesus' blood was the blood of a new covenant that provides remission of sins through his blood, the comparison is naturally to the temporary appeasement that Abel's sacrifice as well as the continued sacrifices throughout redemptive history were a picture of. 
Jesus then, according to this view, has blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel, meaning that Jesus, as he was a sacrifice, his blood spoke a better word than the blood of Abel's sacrifice. And this view is supported by the previous reference to Hebrews chapter 11, but also could be defended logically. Again, Hebrews 11.4, it says that Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain, through which he was commended as righteous, God commending him by accepting his gifts. And through his faith, though he died, he still speaks. In this second segment, we're going to talk about the second view or second possibility that the blood of Abel refers to Abel's blood after Cain killed him. This view is focused a little more on the phrase that refers to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. So how does blood speak? Well, we know that blood does not speak in the literal sense, but what we do know is that God himself said that Abel's blood was crying out to him. To recap the story, Cain was the first son, Abel was the second son, and we pick up the narrative of their sacrifices and the first murder in Genesis chapter 4, starting at verse 3, which says, In the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground. And Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. So Cain was very angry and his face fell. The Lord said to Cain, why are you angry and why has your face fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is contrary to you, but you must rule over it. Abel brought a, an acceptable sacrifice, and Cain did not. We're not necessarily told the reason why Cain's sacrifice was not regarded by the Lord. But it is usually speculated that Abel's sacrifice was the best of what he had, carefully chosen as a true gift to God, and Cain's sacrifice was not given with a level of humility or a heart of humility before the Lord. We don't need to go beyond what Scripture tells us, though. The warning God gives Cain is about the desire for sin being contrary to him, and he must rule over it. The phrasing here is nearly identical to the phrasing of part of the curse that Eve, on behalf of all the women to come after her as well, received. That was in chapter 3 of Genesis. God told Eve, Your desire shall be contrary to your husband, but he shall rule over you. Just as God had said to Cain, that sin is crouching at the door, its desire is contrary to you, but you must rule over it. He also had told Eve, your desire shall be contrary to your husband, and he shall rule over you. The point is that unhealthy desires, sins, are contrary to us. In other words, thoughts of sin are always against our best interests. Cain was told to rule over his sin. Eve was told that her husband would rule over her. Both Eve and Cain are examples of those who did not rule over their desires, but rather let their desires rule over them. You and I as well are in this category. We have all missed the mark and have at many points allowed our desires to rule over us, instead of us ruling over them. In our final segment, I will pull all of this together and hopefully leave us with some encouragement and a desire to press on and continue the battle against the impulses of sin that we all face.
now we're going to take a moment for our glorifying God fact. This one comes from the Answers in Genesis website, where they have a great list of many um, examples of where uh, humans have been trying to imitate nature. Uh, and as things are invented, um, they're often looking at something in nature and trying to duplicate it. Uh, so this one says the following. Human navigational experts have reached a level of technology that enables us to accurately sail across an ocean to reach a minuscule island, yet birds can migrate for many thousands of miles with such accuracy that they land on the same nesting sites each year. The complex navigational equipment that comes standard in a bird's head to achieve this feat weighs next to nothing. We have so far only imperfectly copied their system. Our airplanes use navigational equipment that can weigh a ton and cost a fortune. Humans have discovered numerous ways of detecting magnetic fields that we have put to use in thousands of ways. Yet, research has found many animals possess a sixth sense, namely a magnetic field sensitivity which they use for such purposes as a backup navigation system. Bees expertly use the sun as a compass to make navigational calculations. At night or on very cloudy days, they rely on extensive patterns of polarized skylight. And when those patterns are blocked or abbreviated by clouds, Bees utilize a third non-celestial reference system to guide them to their home, the Earth's magnetic field. The Bible says in Romans 1, 18 through 20, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in things that have been made, so they are without excuse. All we need to do is look at the marvels of creation and see that there is a God. He deserves our complete devotion and worship. His creation is more spectacular than the most amazing human inventions and more spectacular by a great magnitude. In this final segment, we're going to look at understanding the whole passage in context and how that helps us to get the correct meaning. Those that know me and have heard me preach or teach will know how to finish this phrase, context is, and the answer is context is king. In the discipline of reading our Bibles and trying to understand what a verse means, we must always consider the context. Today, more than ever, we are living in a soundbite society. People are less than ever inclined to listen or read something that takes time or undivided attention. We used to say we have a bumper sticker theology. In other words, we depend on things that can be summed up in a short enough way to fit on a bumper sticker. Now bumper stickers are less popular than ever, However, we've replaced that with hashtags and tweets and TikToks and all sorts of ways to communicate. Many websites now will have in their header the length of time it'll take to read a particular page of the website. And I can imagine that many people skip reading if it's more than a few minutes. So we need to create for ourselves a discipline of going deeper into God's Word. It's a discipline because it doesn't come naturally for most people. As we do that, we need to observe the context we are in with any given passage of Scripture. The context we need to consider may be thought of as being in concentric circles. 
The first circle is that closest to the verse in question. So first we say, what is said immediately before and after the verse or passage that we're looking at? That's the first circle. Then beyond that first circle, we may look at the chapter that we're in, and then the book. And if we know the writer, we may look to other sections of Scripture the writer has written. For example, if you're reading something from Ephesians, and you know that Paul wrote that, and uh, you want to take a look then to see, does this fit my understanding of this um, passage? Does it fit with what else Paul has written? And then, of course, we need to see how it fits with the larger context of the Bible. The Bible is a systematic theology, so our understanding of a particular portion of Scripture must fit in with our overall understanding of the Bible. So in our case today, we're looking again at Hebrews 12.24. So we want to look at the first concentric circle, the immediate verses before and after. Uh, And then we can see that the writer is discussing what my Bible has in the heading, a kingdom that cannot be shaken. So let's go back for a moment to verse 18. Uh, It says that, For you have not come to what may be touched, a blazing fire and darkness and gloom and a tempest and the sound of a trumpet and a voice whose words made the hearers beg that no further messages be spoken to them. For they could not endure the order that was given. If even a beast touches the mountain, it shall be stoned. Indeed, so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I tremble with fear. This is a reminder of the terrifying time when the Israelites were near Mount Sinai. This is actually referred to in Pilgrim's Progress. John Bunyan is writing the story of Christian, uh, and Christian is sent off the path. Uh, He's attracted by the idea that there's a person named Mr. Legality who can help him. And the story says this, and I'm reading it from the modern English translation. It says, So Christian turned from his current path to go visit Mr. Legality's house for help. But as he approached the hill, it seemed to be steeper than he first thought. Remember, this hill is representing Mount Sinai. It rose so high that the side of it hung above him. It raised fear in him to venture further, for he was afraid the hill would fall on his head. He stood there trying to figure out what to do, and his burden seemed heavier than ever, much heavier than when he had set out from his home. Flashes of fire erupted from the side of the hill. This is referring to some portions of scripture from Exodus 19 that say there were thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud upon the mount and the voice of the shofar exceeding loud, so that all the people that were in the camp trembled, and all Mount Sinai smoked because the Lord had descended upon it in fire, and its smoke ascended as the smoke of a furnace, and the whole mount quaked greatly. Then continuing on, Bunyan writes, The sight filled Christian with dread that he would be burnt. Sweat beaded across his bow as he trembled with fear. He began to be sorry that he had taken worldly wise men's advice. Just then he spotted Evangelist coming to meet him. While he was relieved to see the man, at the same time the blush of embarrassment heated his face, for he had ignored the man's advice. The story goes on to show how Christian is rebuked by evangelists for going back to the law instead of going the way of Christ. And instead of us doing that, the writer to the Hebrews is saying this, continuing on in verse 22 of chapter 12, But you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God. Remember, this is a compare and contrast. The Bible is full of passages like this. Compare and contrast. We're comparing Mount Sinai to Mount Zion. But you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to innumerable angels in festal gathering, and to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. We can see then that the immediate context above our passage is a comparison 
to the judgment of the law compared to the mercy of the new covenant. Immediately after the verse we are considering, it says that based upon these things, picking back up in verse 25, since we have these examples before us, he writes, See that you do not refuse him who is speaking. For if they did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, much less will we escape if we reject him who warns from heaven. At that time his voice shook the earth, but now he has promised, yet once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. This phrase, yet once more, indicates the removal of things that are shaken, that is, things that have been made, in order that the things that cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, and thus let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. The passage is about warning, a warning not to go back to that mountain, but also it is a message of great hope that we have a kingdom that cannot be shaken if we are in Christ. Moving out to the book of Hebrews, we see that the entire book is a treatise about how Jesus is better. Jesus is better than Moses. He's better than the law. He's better than the prophets. Jesus is fulfillment of those things. Believers must remember that we will be tempted often to measure our salvation by the keeping of the law rather than in the promise of Christ. And this is the teaching of all scripture, that in the redemptive history, God gave a law to show mankind how desperately wicked we are. And this law ought to bring us to our knees in surrender. All of our sins cry out for vengeance, just as Abel's blood cried out to God. Just as God had clothed Adam and Eve with the skin of animals, which teaches us that without the shedding of blood there is no remission of sins, this ultimately points to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. John Corson said this, When Cain killed Abel, God said, Abel's blood cries out to me. What did Abel's blood cry? Justice, judgment, revenge. Jesus' blood also cries out, not justice, but mercy, not judgment, but forgiveness, not revenge, but grace. Thus, the blood of Jesus Christ, the new covenant, makes the birthright and the blessing available to me. End quote. And John Calvin said, The blood of Christ is said to speak better things because it avails to obtain pardon for our sins. The blood of Abel did not properly cry out, for it was his murder that called for vengeance before God. But the blood of Christ cries out, and the atonement made for it is heard daily. God is gracious and kind to us. He provided Christ to all who believe as a permanent, once-for-all sacrifice. His sprinkled blood speaks a better word than Abel. Abel's blood crying out symbolizes how every sin we commit is cosmic treason against a holy God, and vengeance is due to all who sin. But in Christ we have blood that speaks of mercy, for he took on himself the wrath of God, on behalf of those whose salvation is found in him. And that, my friends, is good news indeed. Next week, we'll take a look at a very big challenge. I highlighted this and wrote it in my journal because it was challenging to me from Ecclesiastes 7, verses 21 and 22, which says, Do not take to heart all the things that people say, lest you hear your servant cursing you. Your heart knows that many times you yourself have cursed others. (laughs) So, how are we doing with this? 
Do you take to heart too much the things people say to you? When you receive criticism, how do you process that? And how can we have a healthy attitude even when others may treat us wrongly? Thank you for listening today. If you found this to be helpful or encouraging, would you please share it with someone who may enjoy joining us? Thank you, and I'll see you next time.